I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man cometh to the Father except through Jesus Christ. You know, it's one of the biggest, uh, just as a means of breaking the ice tonight, that's one of the biggest mantras of the New Age uh, religious movement that we found ourselves in in the last uh, 40 years or so. And uh, one of the biggest mantras of paganism, Eastern mysticism, uh, even celebrated celebrities like Oprah will go on her shows and promote that there are many ways to God. Christ is one way, Buddha is another way, Muhammad is another way. Uh, all of these different uh, ways are, uh, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever, is a way to God. But you know what the funny thing is, is that that is not what Christ said. If Christ, if you promote Christ as being a way, Christ did not say he was a way to the Father, but he said that there is no other way except through him. So either Christ is true and he is the only way, or he is a liar and he's no way at all. I mean, you can't have it either other way. Pardon the, pardon the pun there, but uh, some will call Jesus a prophet. Uh, Islam, the religion of Islam, calls Jesus a prophet. Uh, a lot of people in this world say he was a good teacher. Even when he was walking the face of the earth, a lot of people said that he was a good teacher, but they did not believe him to be the son of God. But uh, this world will tell you that Christ was a good teacher, and he was but one of many good teachers that have existed. But the funny thing is, again, as Christ said in John chapter 10, verses 1 and verse 7, that any other person who tries to get you to God, except him, because he said, I am the door. And he said, thieves will come in other ways. But he said, I am the door. And so with that in mind, basically what he is saying is anyone who tells you that they are a way to God, except through Jesus Christ. They are nothing more than thieves and robbers. So you see, there is no middle ground. You either choose to accept Christ, accept his word, accept his teaching, accept his sacrifice, and take him at his word, or you reject him, either outright, you just don't believe in him and you reject him, or you claim that he is but one means of salvation, one means of entry into heaven and one of the ways to God. By saying that, you are rejecting him because that is not what he said and that is not what he claimed. So uh, just as a reminder, Satan will never interfere with anyone promoting Christ as a way to God. But he will unleash the gates of hell upon any who proclaim the truth that Jesus is the only way. <clears throat> his is the only truth, and his is the only way to salvation. Satan loves it when people proclaim Christ as a way, as a good teacher, but he will fight tooth and nail any that dare to proclaim him as he proclaimed himself as the only way. So with that in mind, Bailey, would you start us off on the introduction on page 114, just the first paragraph for starters. Jesus designed the Last Supper as a joyful and peaceful feast, for he knew the terrible hours that were to come soon. Already much had happened that must have filled the hearts of the disciples with anxiety, especially the announcement of a traitor in their midst. The prophecy of Peter's denial of his Lord, and most of all, Christ's clear statement that he was soon to leave them and go far beyond their reach. But from the darkness of these announcements came some of the most important words ever spoken by Jesus. All right. So the Last Supper was designed as a joyful and peaceful feast. But it kind of wound up as, as kind of a bizarre, at least in the minds of the disciples. It had to be a, a bizarre, maybe not the right word, but just a confusing night. Because 
you talk about a poignant gathering. You have on one hand, they were gathered for a ritual Passover seder, a Passover dinner. This is something that in every one of their lives they had had, you know, it's like our Thanksgiving dinner. You kind of know what to expect if you have Thanksgiving dinner. So in their mind, they're saying we're gathering for a Passover seder and this is what's going to happen and this is what's going to happen. And it was a ritual. It was a routine. And so with that as a backdrop, then, of course, they show up and uh, you have Christ beginning with washing their feet, which foot washing was a common practice. But having your Lord and having the master do it and not one of the servants was unusual. And then in the middle of all this, we begin a procedure and, and uh, which could best be described described as a Jewish wedding betrothal process in the middle of this Passover Seder Christ begins to utter things which are uttered when a groom is coming to take a bride and so that's not normal that's unusual and so they're looking at this and in the middle of this you have uh, Judas coming in late and then running out late in a hurry after Jesus said that somebody would betray him and then in the middle of all that Jesus begins saying that the cup that they are drinking is his blood, and the bread that they are eating is his body. Uh, and then, for probably a half hour, Jesus begins to talk to his father, talking about his disciples, praying to the father, with the disciples in the room, almost as if they're not even there, <laughs> as, as, as the Lord is carrying on the conversation uh, with his father. And so the disciples were probably really confused, uh, it, it probably didn't dawn on them the significance of everything that was going on until <coughs> after the events of the week were over, after Christ had ascended, probably even in the upper room, they were probably still, before Pentecost, they were probably still dwelling on that as they were tearing for the Holy Spirit uh, to come. And so it even ends with them, instead of it, when supper was over, it was bedtime, but instead, they leave not only the building, but they leave town. They go outside the walls. Jesus said, let's go and pray. And when they should be going to sleep, when they're tired and it was bedtime, they're out in the middle of the garden of Gethsemane on the outskirts of town praying. So just what is an incredible night that is taking place. And uh, we're going to get into some more detail. But I'm sure they were scratching their head and saying, what is going on tonight? This is a Passover night like no other. And in fact, it was indeed a Passover like night like no other. Bailey, next prayer. Though our Lord would be betrayed that night by one disciple, denied by another, forsaken by all the rest, mistreated by soldiers, unjustly tried, and within 24 hours to be crucified, yet he continually thought of the comfort and hope of his followers. Life for the disciples was going to flip upside down, and at such a time, there is only one thing to do, stubbornly hold on to God and trust him. The psalmist David said, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. For my eyes are unto thee, O God, the Lord in thee is my trust. How many has ever been in a time of your life where it seemed like life was flipping upside down? That things were not going the way you had hoped. And you were at the end of what you knew to do. And I like how he said here that all you can do in such times is just stubbornly hold on to God and just look to God. And it was no different for Christ that night. And one thing that struck me in, in the author here in this last part of the second paragraph of the introduction is quoting the Psalms. And we just talked about how difficult a night, how poignant a night, how confusing a night it was for the disciples, even the events of that week, starting out with, with Christ being welcomed into Jerusalem uh, as the Messiah, and the disciples probably feeling like they were on top of the world, and that things, their lives were about to change for the better, and for, you know, just beyond their wildest imaginations, they were giddy. And now here they are, four days later, three days later, and the crowd has turned, the elders, they don't want to kill him. Jesus has told them that Peter's going to deny him. Jude, one of them is going to betray him. 
and he's going away. And they're just, they were at that point where there was, they didn't know what to do. But I love what it says in the book of Matthew, chapter 26 and verse 30, about this night. It says that when they ended the supper, before they left to go to Gethsemane, it says they ended by singing a hymn. And now what's the hymn book of the Word of God? The, the hymn book that they had, it was the Psalms. And uh, it was likely, there is, I, I have no reason to doubt that there was a song, because the, the traditions and the rituals of the Jews was such that there was a song that was sung at the end of every Passover Seder. How it was chosen, where it began, this tradition, I know not. But I guarantee you that the Holy Spirit orchestrated it because as they left that supper that night, they sang the traditional hymn that was sung to conclude every Passover Seder. And it is Psalms chapter 116. And let me, I won't read it all, it's 19 verses, but let me pick a few verses here and there and phrases of Psalms 116 and imagine this is how that, what picture is portrayed on our wall of the Last Supper and all that confusion, all that was about to take place. This is how they concluded that dinner, by singing, the Lord hath, the Lord, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and he's heard my supplication. Verse 3, the sorrows of death come past me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me, and I found terrible sorrow, but then called I upon the name of the Lord, and O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Verse 8, for thou hast delivered my soul from death, and mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 12. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits for me? Look at this, verse 13. I will take the cup of salvation. What was it that Christ had just lifted up? But the cup that he said was his blood, which is for our salvation. He says, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Verse 15. Don't tell me this didn't resonate with Jesus. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O oh Lord, truly, I am thy servant. I am thy servant, and what? And the son of thy handmaid, and thou hast loosed my bonds. Verse 17, I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and will call upon the name of the Lord. And where is this all going to take place? What's going to happen? Listen to how it concludes. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem. Praise you, Lord. Think about that night. And think about, see, this was a song. I'm just reading it to you. But this was a song that they sung. Can you imagine when they got to those words? Jesus singing, saying, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Jesus saying, I will take the cup of salvation. Jesus singing with them that he was going to pay his vow in the presence of the people of God in the middle of Jerusalem. That he knew that that song, that Passover appointed song that they were singing, much like when he took the book of Isaiah when his ministry started. And he read that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then he told them, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. No doubt that was how his ministry began on this earth. And as his ministry winds up, once again, he's quoting scripture, singing scripture, knowing that he is fulfilling the words of the Lord. So like the author said in our introduction, life, in life's darkest hours, when we're faced with the most impossible of situations, all we can do is fall into the hands of the Lord and put our trust in him. And that's exactly what Jesus did that night <coughs> on the way to the Father. All right, uh, finish out the introduction. As Christians, we experience times where we have to believe what we cannot prove and accept what we cannot understand. However, Jesus Christ provides absolute proof that God is willing to give us everything we need. Paul said, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall we not with him also freely give us all things? In light of God's amazing love, it becomes possible to accept what we can understand. With this kind of faith, we can face the struggle.
storms of life and maintain our relationship with God. All of this is possible because we have in Jesus Christ a personal Savior and friend, and in the Holy Spirit we have a comforter who will be with us forever. All right. As I said, there will come in each and every life a put up or shut up time. A time when your faith is put to the test, when you won't, uh, you won't have anything to stand upon. You won't have the word of a doctor to stand upon because it'll be a bad word. You won't have the word of the government to stand upon because the government may be falling apart. You won't have a bank account balance to stand upon because it may disappear and fall away. There will come a time in each and every life where it will be a test of your faith and all you will be taken out of your control <coughs> and it was no difference for Jesus <coughs> this night from Gethsemane until the grave everything was taken out of his control except he had the chance to say no but for you and I he let go of control and he did what you and I can do always do in those times Give it to God and say, Father, not my will, but your will be done. When we have nowhere else to turn but faith itself. God prepares us for these times if we're humble enough to accept it and wise enough to recognize it. How many knows that when you face life's darkest hour, it will likely not be the first time in your life you face a trial or you face a difficulty? And God will have prepared you for life's darkest hour if you're humble enough to accept it and wise enough to recognize when you're going through these times that God is preparing you for an even darker and more difficult task that may lie ahead. Pain and discomfort and stress are life's reward for the unrighteous, but to the godly, they are but a brief instructional experience on the road to glory. Let me say that again. Pain discomfort and stress are life's reward for the unrighteous that's that's the end that's what they have at the end that's all they have but to the godly all of these things are but a brief instructional experience on the road to glory weeping may endure for the night and we talked about this sunday morning but joy will always come in the morning on god's calendar morning is always just ahead Morning always lies ahead. Amen. All right, top of page 115, Jesus is the way. Section A, the promise, and this is dealing with uh, verses 1 through 3 of John 14. And uh, let me just read, let me just read uh, verses 1 through 7. That'll be the gist of our lesson tonight. And most of you know, especially the first part of this by heart. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, and my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I like what somebody said when it said, Jesus, the cross was, some people look at the cross as some unfortunate outcome uh, uh, in Jesus' life. But when Jesus said, I go, it meant that it wasn't an accident, but it was his plan. And his purpose. He wasn't crucified by the Romans or taken captive by the Jews, but he had the path and the purpose already in mind. He did it himself. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we don't know where you're going and how we how can we know the way and jesus said unto him i am the way the truth and the life no man cometh to the father but by me and if you had known me you should have known my father also and from henceforth you know him and have seen him so bailey reread those first three verses and uh, read paragraphs one and two for us. let not your heart be troubled you believe in god believe also in me Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Heart trouble is one of the most common problems in the world. No rank or class or lifestyle is exempt from it. No bars, bolts, or locks can keep it out. It has many causes, and medical science is constantly seeking a cure for it. 
but a complete cure is out of the range of their expertise. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the only sure cure for troubled hearts. He urged his followers to believe more thoroughly, trust more entirely, rest more unreservedly, and lay hold more firmly. Okay. Uh, before I come any further, I meant to make mention at the beginning of the lesson, I don't really have a lot of preordained <laughs> questions in here. So if you feel the need to comment or something you want to ask or comment, just kind of uh, raise your hand or interrupt. Uh, I don't have quite the same amount of questions embedded in the lesson tonight, so I wanted to say that. But it's talking about heart trouble being one of the most common problems in the world. Probably some of us in this room could probably raise our hands if we have dealt with some heart issues at one time or another, and there's not very many of us that are, you know, that old, per, per se. Some, some of you may disagree, but I'd say there's, I'm just looking in this room, I see a lot of young people in this room tonight. But time and again, medical science has shown the ill and the danger and the damage that worry and stress can do to the human heart and thus to the body. I mean, know that's also the same for the spirit. Worry and stress can damage your soul and spirit as well. Uh, I just talked a few minutes ago about how crazy and abnormal and troubling the events of that Passover night, that Last Supper night, uh, the days, events, even the events leading up to that evening must have been uh, for Jesus and for his disciples. And Jesus recognized uh, the worry and the stress that was upon, the confusion, the doubt, the fear. Uncertainty. He could he could see that. He could sense that and read it. And he began his sermonette, his devotional time that night, with these words directly speaking to his disciples' own uncertainty. And he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, you believe also in me and my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. So in so doing, he gave us a formula that we should remember whenever we face trouble in our lives. Two secrets embedded in those words right there. Number one is that we have God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit on our side. No matter what trouble or trial you face, how many knows that our God is bigger than any trial? So Jesus looking at his disciples' uncertainty, knowing that they were having some not only currently, but we're going to have some anxious days lying ahead of them. Wanted them to remember, hey, you believe in God and believe in me. And that can get you through any difficulty that this life faces. And number two, the, the second part of this formula to rid yourself of worry and stress is to remember that this world and its troubles are not our hope and not our future. But there is a far better trouble-free dwelling place in existence still to come. So whatever you're facing in this world, just realize that anything on this earth is only temporary. But we have a promise and a hope of a future where there will be no more trouble. There will be no more trials. There will be no more anxious moments. No more worry and no more cares. Amen? Somebody had a quote, I liked it. It's not mine, but I'm going to quote it anyway. It says, Jesus never wanted us to have life without trouble, but he promised that we could have an untroubled heart, even in a troubled life. I'll say it again. Jesus never wanted us to have a life without trouble. Troubles are necessary. Troubles are a part of life. He said, in this life, you will have trouble. And it wasn't like he had a trouble-free life. He faced trouble. He faced pain, just like any of us. So he wasn't, you know, it wasn't, well, it's easy for you to say. He faced more troubles, more rejection, <laughs> more pain and suffering than all of us probably combined will ever understand or know. So he didn't promise us a trouble-free life, but he promised us that we could have an untroubled heart, even in the midst of the trouble of life. We don't know the benefit of our difficulty more often than not. We don't understand. When we're in the middle of our trials and our season of testing, our suffering, our pain, we cannot always understand the purpose and the reason behind them. And Jesus' disciples during this course of the events that we're talking about 
were the same way. They didn't understand why they were going through what they were going through, but their anxiety and their confusion that night led to one of the most comforting words ever spoken, which has uplifted the souls of man for over 2,000 years. And I would dare say, perhaps with the exception of Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, there is probably no more quoted passage of scripture than John chapter 14, that Jesus spoke to comfort his disciples that night. They didn't realize it, but their anxiety and their worry, their trial in that time is our blessing for today and has been a blessing to men and women of God for 2,000 years. The words of Jesus, let not your heart be troubled. Amen. Bailey, read uh, 3, 4, 5, and 6, if you can counsel for little ones. The disciples of the Lord had already proven the reality of their faith. They had renounced everything to follow Jesus. Now they were troubled. Jesus was touched by their feelings of anxiety, despondency, and despair. Therefore, he comforted them. Jesus reminded them of how they first began. unchanging faithfulness and his wondrous love. The word house is used throughout the New Testament for any ordinary home. However, it refers more to the household or family living in a particular house than the building itself. Fatherhood speaks of home, family, and love. A father on earth would naturally belong to some home and our father in heaven has his home. Christ knew about the father's house because he had come down from the father. A Greek word for mansion means abiding places. There seems to be an intentional contrast between the unchanging, unvarying house in heaven and the changing, uncertain dwellings of this world. Here people are ever moving, there God's children shall move no more. Is that it? Yes. Uh, I messed up that uh, that's 34, 38 when we get to it. In God's household, there are many mansions. How many times have we as Christians talked about our mansions and glory? Just build my mansion next door to Jesus. I've got a mansion just over a hilltop. I don't Diego in, in Spanish culture, in you know, in the church where you're from, do they have songs that talk about man your mansion in heaven? It's kind of a common theme, isn't it, in amongst Christian circles. I'm amused at times to hear people talk about what their mansion is going to be like. And I'm only amused, not because I, I, I'm belittling it or and not believing it. That's not, not it at all. I'm only amused in light of what Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 2 and 9. And that is, I have not seen, nor has ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. So we imagine a mansion. We talk about a mansion because that's the way the King James translated that word as mansion. And so in our minds, we think of a big house. We think, of, and, and you think about it, what is a man, what's in a mansion? Well, there's a lot of bathrooms in that. A mansion is a mansion because it may have five bathrooms. Do you need a bathroom in heaven? But probably, more than likely, your mansion in heaven is not going to have a bathroom. Uh, it's going to have, what's a mansion? You talk about how many bedrooms are in your mansion. How many know that we don't need a bedroom in heaven because we'll never have to sleep? Well, maybe it's the big flat screen TV. Doubt that you'll be watching a lot of television in heaven. The refrigerator, nothing spoils or goes bad in heaven. You don't need a big refrigerator. Closets, you think you need closets in heaven? I read that we're just going to have one robe, <laughs> a robe of life, and so I don't know what you would need a closet for. We don't need driveways and mailboxes or garages in heaven. So what in the world, but why do we, you know, what's in our mansion then? Why do we say it's a mansion? Well, it's because in our mind, we just go to what we know, and that's what we think about. And I, like I said, I, oh, I hope my mansion has a this or that in it, you know, and, and we just 
the Bible tells me that we can't comprehend what God has prepared for us. I, no eye has ever seen it. And I like, it ends by saying, neither has it entered. I mean, we can't even, if you can think about it, if you can envision it, it's not in heaven. <laughs> because neither has it entered into the heart of man. In other words, you can't imagine it. You can't, you don't know what it's all like. So we are guilty of selling God short <laughs> when we talk about our mansion. The biggest, whatever, if everything's gold-plated and it's 50,000 square feet, whatever it is, you're selling God short. Because what he has prepared for you is a lot better than any mansion that you can imagine. So let's look at that word mansion and see what is actually being conveyed there. Now, do you remember when I read this? I, and that's a, the beauty of Bible study is that I've read these passages all my life. And it wasn't until studying for this lesson that I realized the word that was used and where else in the context it has been used. Do you remember a few weeks ago when we were referencing John chapter 8, verse 31, where Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples. Remember, we spent quite a bit of time about that. Now, or another word for continue is abide. If you abide in my word, then you're my disciple. How many knows you're not a disciple, a follower of Jesus, unless you have Abide. It's not just you believe in him. Because we were talking in context, there was all kinds of people in Jerusalem that believed in him. But Jesus withheld himself from them because he knew they were not of, they didn't walk in his word. They didn't follow his commandments. They did not abide with him. Now, that word abide that he uses there, if you abide in my word, then you're my disciples. That same word was the word he used in Gethsemane when he said, could you not tear with me for one hour? Could you not abide with me for one hour? This is the same word that is used in the book of Luke, chapter 27 and verse 40, or 24, verse 49, when he said, tarry in Jerusalem or abide in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So this word, tarry, and abide, is the Hebrew word, and some of you may remember, it's, it's uh, meno. In your Strong's Concordance, it's the Greek word number 3306. And I'm turning back a few weeks ago in my, in my Bible study, and here's what I said about Strong's word 3306, meno. It means to continue, to stay. A state or a place of expectancy and to tarry. And this is the same word that Jesus used when he said, tarry in Jerusalem until you receive power. Tarry here with me and watch in Gethsemane. And then when he said, could you not tarry or abide with me for one hour? And so the disciples in Gethsemane could not even tarry with him. For one hour. But how many know true disciples of the Lord not only believe in Him, but they abide. They tarry with Him. So going now to back to, to this week's lesson, the word for mansion is Strong's Word 34. And I plug that up here. Strong's Word 3438. And if you look up Strong's Word 3438, it will say related to Word 3306, which was Mino. But this is the word translated mansion, and it's Monet. If you're transliterating into English, M-O-N-A-I. Monet. In my father's house are many Monet. And the King James translated it mansion. So what does it mean? Well, it is connected to word 3306, which we said means to abide with, tarry with. So, in my Father's house are many tarrying, abiding places. There are places all over my Father's kingdom where we can see. Why were the disciples anxious? Because Jesus said, I'm going to lead you. And 
the disciples' hearts were troubled. And Jesus comforted them by saying, hey, guys, don't worry. In my Father's house, there's all kinds of places where we can be together. We're just like they were that night in that room in that for that Passover dinner. There's all kinds of places in, in my Father's kingdom where we can abide together. And we can be together and dwell. But he didn't stop there. And he said, Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. In Gethsemane, he said, couldn't you abide with me one hour? Now the disciples are grieved because they're saying he's leaving. But he comforts them by saying, does he, does he say, in my father's house there are 10,000 square foot, four car garage, five bathroom, five bedroom, three story houses? Did that bring him comfort? No. He said, there are many monad, abiding places, areas where we can just be together. How many just like, why is it the holidays, Christmas? Thanksgiving. What makes those special? Is it is it the turkey? Is that what really makes it special for Thanksgiving? Is it the gifts and unwrapping the gifts? Those are fun. Is that really what makes the holiday special? Or is it you know that you have a place prepared and a time that you can just abide with your loved one? You can just sit around and talk enjoy each other, come, tell stories and laugh, and just be completely free of worry and peace. That's how Jesus comforted them. But he goes on to say, and I, not only are there many of these places in my father's house, he said, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a special place of tarry and abiding just for you. Think about that. A special God, the Lord Jesus Christ, has gone away. And he said while he was gone, he was going to create a special place where you and he can tarry and just abide and commune and exist and visit. And you can be with your creator. Eden was such a place. Did you know that God the earth already existed but God created a place where he could abide and dwell and commune with his people and Jesus said I'm going there's already in my father's kingdom there's a lot of places like this and it, that would be enough but he said since I'm going away I'm going to take the opportunity and the time that I have going away to create a special place of abiding just for you and me. Think about that. It's not a it's not a house. It doesn't have a roof on it more than <coughs> likely. Maybe it is. We don't know exactly what it is. But we have a place prepared for us an eternal and an eternal time and an eternal place just to be with the Lord. And we will never have the dark cloud of having to say goodbye. Like that night that they were saying goodbye in the upper room. And Jesus is saying, I'm going away. There is a place that he's preparing where we can tarry and we'll never have that cloud of goodbye hanging over our head again. And that joy, the love, the friendship, the interaction uh, that we'll have with the Lord will never cease. And I can, I can tell you, uh, I, I can't tell you what that place is going to be. I'm pretty sure it's not a house, but it might be. It could be a garden, like the Garden of Eden was. It could be. That could be the place that he's prepared for me or for you. Who knows? It could be a whole national park place. It could have mountains and forests and meadows and streams. I don't know. It could be a whole planet that he's prepared. That could be your place. See, we sell God short. We think of a house. But who knows? It could be an entire universe. He might have a place prepared and you open the door and you step into another infinite universe that's just yours and his to dwell in together and to, to abide. All I know is we're told that I have not seen nor his ear 
hear her, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that he has prepared for them that love him. All I do know is he has prepared a special place for you and for me. And for that reason, he said, let not your heart be troubled. Amen? Mm -hmm. Bailey, read verse 7, or paragraph 7. Christ's intention was to comfort his disciples by telling them that nothing could remove them from their heavenly home. They might be cast out of the temple and find no resting place or refuge on earth, but there would always be room for them in heaven. Mm. You, might, <laughs> you might get kicked out of a lot of places here on earth. You might not be welcome in a lot of places here on earth. But it says here that there is a heavenly home waiting for us. A place to abide. A monet. A mansion. Whatever that may entail. It may be. But I was, when he said that heavenly home I remembered the lyrics of that old Hymns of the Spirit song. The other hymnal that we sing from. And there's a song by that name. That heavenly home. And I, I pulled up the lyrics here. It says I'm looking away beyond the dark stream. To heaven's fair home of which I oft dream. Their millions have gone its glory to share. Get ready, my friend, to live over there. That heavenly home lies over death's sea. Their loved ones I know are waiting for me. With Jesus will live in glory divine. That heavenly home will surely be mine. That wonderful home will never be sold. Will ever live there. Where no one grows old. The city's bright spires, the sun will outshine. With all of the saved, that home shall be mine. Verse 3, that heavenly home has mansions of light. No storm clouds will rise, no shadows of night. No sorrow, no pain, all sin will be gone. We'll live with the Lord while ages roll on. Amen. That heavenly home. How many is looking forward to that abiding place? Jesus said, I have prepared that place for you. Amen. Finish this out, Bailey, the next uh, distant five page. Jesus reminded the disciples that they could have confidence in his promises. If it were not so, I would have told you. It is as if he were saying, do not be afraid because I'm leaving you. There is plenty of room for you in heaven. The promise I will come again refers to the second advent of Christ. He went away in bodily form, visible to those who stood with him on the mount from which he ascended. He will return as he went away. This is what the angels told the disciples on the day of Christ's ascension. We should be encouraged with Christ's absolute confidence. He knew his destiny. He knew what he would do when he reached his destination. He knew he would come back again. And he knew he had the power to receive to himself all <coughs> those who believed in him. Okay. If you turn the page over to 116, that shaded box I want to read real quick. It says, uh, it's a quote from D.L. Moody. We talk about heaven being so far away, yet it is within speaking distance to those who belong there. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared and that, that thought about it's only in speaking distance to those who belong there. How many realize that our prayers, I mean, we're talking about this place that Jesus has prepared for us, that heavenly home, God's kingdom. But our prayers and our worship and our singing goes there before us. Our, the, think about this. Our cares, our worship, and our prayers carry our voices to the place our Lord and loved ones inhabit that our bodies cannot yet go. Think about that. When we sing the songs of Zion, they can hear us on the other side. When we pray, though our heart longs to be with our loved ones and our Lord, when we pray and when we worship, our voice is being carried. To that land that our bodies can't yet go to. And I wonder how many times that God, it, it reminded me thinking about that, thinking about our loved ones and our Lord hearing our voices down here. 
what we sing about the place that we so long to be but we can't go yet. I wonder how often God tells those assembled, hey guys, let me put them on speaker so you can hear. You know, sometimes my wife will travel for work and she may be on the other side of the world or the other side of the country and she'll call and I'll put the phone down and I'll say, let me put you on speaker so the kids can hear you. So that we can all commune and talk together as if we're together physically, right? You ever done that? Imagine when we're singing and we're praying and we're worshiping God. You never know that God might see your, one of your loved ones and say, hey, let me put him on the speaker. Let him hear your voice. Let him know what's going on. That that heavenly hope is in your heart. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's try to go a little bit further and get your money's worth tonight. So about another 10 minutes or so. And we'll be there. Page 116 is continuing. Uh, section B, the explanation. Bailey, go ahead, <coughs> go ahead and read verses 4 to 6 in the first paragraph. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. From one standpoint, the disciples knew very little. They knew little before the crucifixion and resurrection compared to what they might have known. They knew little compared to what they would have known after, no, after the day know. They knew little compared to what they would know. I'm like, is this the same thing? <laughs> Their ignorance was glaring concerning the Lord's purpose in coming to the world and his need to suffer a sacrificial death on the cross. Amen. Thank God for Thomas. Amen. He gets a bad rap, doubting Thomas. You know what? But Thomas, I mean, he was no doubt vocalizing a question unashamedly what everyone was thinking that night when Jesus said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And he's probably, you know, like his mind's wandering and he's going, Lord, how do we, I don't know where you're going. How do we know the way to, to get there? Uh, he was, he was the one that wasn't afraid to ask the questions. Just like uh, after the resurrection, when he wasn't around to see the Lord, I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to need some proof. I'm going to need to touch him, you know, and, and thank God he did because of his desire and his questions in his mind, he was able to verify for you and I that the Lord wasn't a ghost, but he had a body. And because of his questions and saying, Lord, how are we going to know the way? That question opened up, one of the, opened the door for Jesus to utter one of the greatest statements ever uttered. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so his, uh, he would do the same uh, like I said, after the resurrection, so that we would know that Jesus had a body. But how many knows it's good sometimes to not be afraid to ask a question? It's good sometimes when we don't know exactly what's going on or confused to just not be afraid to be embarrassed, but just ask that question of the Lord. And maybe it's in that question that you're asking on behalf of everyone that the Lord will respond in such a way that it will be a benefit to each and every one. And I want to read, because it's similar, if we uh, look over the next page on 117, it's similar to what Philip would soon say. Let me read paragraphs 1 and 2 here on the bottom of page 117. Because Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it would suffice, suffice us. It said, we do not know Philip's motive in making the request, show us the Father. He was one of the first to be called by Jesus to be a disciple. And he proved his zeal for Christ by immediately telling Nathaniel that Christ uh, has said the Father was being revealed to them. But Philip was slow to understand this. For Philip, saying the Father may have meant to have a glorious vision as Moses had on Mount Horeb, or such a resplendent sight as Christ himself had uh, presented on the Mount of Transfiguration. Philip had heard the voice of God speaking to Jesus at the baptism, and again when he and Andrew brought the Greeks to him. Now he wanted still more to see the infinite one with his mortal eyes. Perhaps he thought that such a vision would solve all of his doubts 
but Christ knew better. And if you have the handout, you don't have this, but on the next page uh, at the top, where <coughs> Jesus responded and said, Philip, have I not been so long a time with you? And do you not realize that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? And paragraph, uh, the next paragraph says, the response of Christ was undoubtedly a gentle rebuke. <coughs> the expression of so long a time is important when we remember Philip was one of the first disciples whom Jesus called. The meaning seems to be, after three long years, Philip, do you not yet thoroughly know and understand who I am? So I, I wanted to say, bring all this into the question, into the fray here, because even in three years with Jesus, and they still didn't grasp the enormity and the fullness of what Jesus had been trying to teach them and relay to them for three years. So let me, here's our, here's my one main question tonight. Was there a fault with Jesus as a teacher? Is that why after three years, Thomas and Philip still could not grasp these things? Was it Jesus' fault? Or can we have lots of knowledge and still be ignorant of the deeper things of God? What would you say? They were still, uh, we talk about that when the children of Israel were in the wilderness. It's, it wasn't that uh, they had, God was getting them out of Egypt. It was he had to get Egypt out of them. And it's kind of the same thing. Jesus had been with them three years getting the world out, uh, you know, getting them out of the world. Tell, he was telling them he was going to get them out of the world, but they still hadn't got all the world out of them. And that's what happens to you and I. We're in this world. And because of that, our vision is clouded. We can't see. That's like when we're talking about mansions. We've spent our whole lives imagining a big house. But if we don't even stop to think it really doesn't make sense. We don't need bathrooms and closets and kitchens and stuff in heaven. So, you know, and, and why? Because we can't get past our worldly vision. And it's, a, it's the same way. Even though we've studied the word of God, we know God, we've spent time with him, some of us, our entire lives, some of us for years, and yet we can still be ignorant of deeper things of God. Greg, what do you think? I was just thinking, you know, we can see a little bit of ourselves in all the disciples, so that's a great lesson for us, right. but we have thousands of accounts and thousands of years of history right here, mm -hmm. and we struggle sometimes. I couldn't imagine being the trailblazer, <laughs> you know, from day one. <laughs> You know, Moses I mean, you or something, know, you know, like you didn't have Jesus' brother. I mean, his family is like he's insane. You know, it's like yeah. there's, there's a whole question of being a trailblazer, so I could imagine being in that generation. Yeah, he took out the trash last night, and today he's saying he's the son of God. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like we can't, we, you, you know, we make fun of them, but at the same, you know, how could the children of Israel see the Red Sea part and, and still not believe that God could get them to the other side? Oh, yeah? Well, how could you believe that God, who had done this, 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 and this for you in your life, now all of a sudden is abandoned? But we do that, don't we? That's our human nature. Um, Bailey, let's, we got to finish this up. Read the second paragraph there on section B on 116. However, 116, 116 page. There again, I kind of reminded us that there's a lot we don't know, right? But how many know that even in our ignorance, we have more insight and more understanding and more knowledge than most in this world? Amen? Even our limited knowledge and insight, and as Paul said, we see through a glass darkly right now. But even with that, we're still wiser than the most lettered professor at any university who is lost does not know the Lord as Savior. I couldn't help thinking about that and thinking my grandpa only had a third grade education, and yet there he was one of the shrewdest people, one of the wisest people, one of the most understanding and insightful people that I've ever 
know in my life. He always knew what to say, always had the right words for the right occasion, and he was wise beyond imagination, and yet he only had a third grade education. Who does that? How has that come about? It's because he didn't spend a lot of time in worldly textbooks, but he spent a lifetime in this word. And, you know, education is great, but you know what? I would rather be known as the disciples in the book of Acts when those same ignorant and unlearned disciples that we're talking about and making fun of the knowledge that they didn't have Yet it wasn't that long after they got the baptism of the Holy Spirit that they were in the temple. And they were confounding the Pharisees and the elders of Israel. And these guys were scratching their head. The learned, the educated, the doctors, the lawyers, uh, the elite of Israel. They're saying, aren't these fishermen from Galilee? Aren't they ignorant and unlearned? And yet, listen to their teaching and their words. All I know is that they've been with Jesus. I would much rather have the world look at me and say, he doesn't have a degree, he doesn't have a doctorate, he doesn't have a master's, but man, he must have been with Jesus, because he has the words of eternal life. We're Even in our ignorance and our lack of understanding, if we spent time with him, we have more wisdom than this world will ever know. Let me finish with this last quote from Thomas a Kempis. It's in talking about Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. And without the life, there is no living. Amen. Are you glad that we know who Jesus is tonight? Are you glad that he is the way, the truth, and the life? And glad that he's gone to prepare a place for you. So let me remind you to remind yourself of that. The next time you're faced with a trial or difficulty in this life, just remember the words of John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. I believe in God. Hey, if God be for us, who can be against us? Right. And just remember that this world is not our home. But there is a, a, an abiding place. He has gone to prepare just for you that still awaits us no matter how dark today is the morning is coming when we will abide with him forever amen